We're going to camp in the last chapter of Job chapter 42. We're going to find out what you and I are going to have to do in our life if we're going to experience that uh, restoration that comes after tragedy and loss. You know, when I look over people's lives and I see people going through tragedy and loss, I don't see too many people recovering from that anymore. I find them withering in the midst of their tragedy and loss, and they've lost the radiance of their spirituality. They begin to fade out of the church scene. They begin to, to lose their zeal and thrill for ministry and service, and I, I see very few people experiencing this restoration that comes from God that takes them to a brand new chapter in life. And I, that's why I want to camp here for at least uh, three, uh, we'll, we'll do two more weeks of Job chapter 42 unless the Lord um, inspires me to preach on. But I, I want us to get a grasp of what it means and what we need to do to experience that restoration, that transformation after a tragedy. Well, Job chapter 42 verses 1 through Six reads like this. It says, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do anything or everything, and that no purpose of your you can be withheld, or no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You ask, Who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, and things were too wonderful for me which I did not know. So listen, please, and let me speak. You say, I will question you and you will answer me. Now notice what he says in verse 5. I have heard of you by the hearing of my ears, but now, here we go, but now my eyes have seen thee. And therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Let's pray. Father God is... We come to this beginning, this new beginning of Job. We find out that Job's going to have to be honest with himself. He's going to have to see himself as God sees him. He's going to have to stop all this presumptuous charges against God and start to move from not trusting in himself, but trusting in God alone. He's going to have to see himself as God sees him, and then with that self-revelation, experience God in a new transformation. And Lord, I pray that all of us will learn how to experience complete restoration from our losses and our tragedies in life. In the name of Jesus we pray, and amen. Today I, I want you to see what happens to an individual's lives when they have a real, authentic, genuine encounter with God. Do you know that all of us believe in something? All of us have some presuppositions or some premises. What I mean by that? Some basic, fundamental, foundational belief in something or something. Even the atheist believes in something. Did you know that? He believes there's not a God, but also he believes in himself. And thus this self-belief and he, how he tries to deify himself as his own God, as he looks at life as from me, myself, and I perspective, he begins to build his humanistic philosophy that centers around him. All of us have our philosophies of life, don't we? We all have our worldviews. We all have our uh, religious beliefs. We, we may not make them known publicly, but they're personally held in each and every one of us. And we know that we Christians have a premise, a foundational belief. And what do we believe? We have faith in God, don't we? That's the basis of our belief. We say we're believers. Amen. We believe in a supreme, sovereign, awesome God. Well, here we're going to see what happens to Job when he has a dynamic encounter with God that changes his life. Get out your outlines. I want you to see three things about Job today that I believe will transform your life if you apply them. 
First of all, I want you to see Job's premise. What do I mean by premise? His foundational belief. Job had two premises that he built his worldview around. The first premise of Job is that he had faith in God's infinite power and incredible sovereignty. In other words, he believed that God was in control of all things. Notice what he says in Job chapter 42, verse 2. He says, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. In other words, he's saying, God, this is the basis of my belief. This is my fundamental belief system about you. I believe that you're omnipotent. You're all-powerful. I believe you're omniscient, you're all-knowing. I believe you're omnipresent everywhere at all times. There's nothing that you cannot do. I believe in your sovereign ability, your all-controlling ability to take everything that happens to us, whether it's good or whether it's bad. And the Bible tells us that all things work together for the good of those that love God and are called according to his purpose. You know, you and I have to choose to believe, don't we? Belief is a choice. Either we're going to choose to believe like Job or we're going to choose to not to believe like an atheist in the power and presence and strength and sovereignty of God. Many, several years ago, there was a book called The Atheistic Christian. Have you ever heard of that book called The Atheistic Christian? I never heard such a thing. It seemed to be diametrically opposed to each other. But you know, I met a lot of Christians I think are atheists. Oh, they say they believe in God, but when situations and circumstances come into their life, they act like they're atheists. Amen? And if they believe in God, their God is all too small. Here Job has come to the realization through his losses and through his tragedies that he believes in an awesome God. And as finite creatures, you and I cannot fully comprehend who God is. But just because we cannot fully understand who God is doesn't mean that we can't believe and have an experience in an awesome God. Remember what the Bible says? The Bible says that you and I have to have a foundational belief, a foundational faith before we can experience God. In Hebrews 11:6, it says that without faith it is impossible to please God. For we must believe that, who, that he is, and he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You see, we've got to begin with one element, and that's faith. And if we don't have that one element of faith, we'll never experience the pleasure of experiencing and encountering God in our lives. Yes, you and I will never fully understand the infinite creator God of the universe. But just because we don't understand everything about him doesn't mean that we can't experience him. My friends, you don't know everything about your pastor. There may be some mysteries about your pastor you're not aware of, but just because there's some mysteries about me doesn't mean that you can't know me in a personal, dynamic way. Amen? Here Job realizes there's some deep mysteries about God that he will never ever comprehend or understand the whys and the how comes and the what ifs of life. But that wasn't going to continue to keep him from encountering an awesome God of the universe. Notice something else about Job. I want you to see that not only uh, does Job have faith in the incredible power and infinite sovereignty of God. But here's the second thing that, that Job realized. Job realized his own inadequacies. Notice what he says in verse 3. You ask, in other words, he's quoting from the question God gave to him in Job chapter 38. Who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, or things too above my understanding, which I did not know. Now, what is Job saying there? Remember when Job began to make some rash charges against God? Remember that? In Job chapter 37 and 38, Job has went through such loss and such tragedy and st such a dark night of the soul. He begins to demand of God that God breaks his divine silence, that God gives him an audience from heaven, that God will hear him out and let Job validate himself before God. Remember, God showed up. 
And how did God show up? Can anybody remember that sermon a couple of weeks ago? In a whirlwind, a, a tormatic activity happened. You know, I, I think Job was probably wanting God to show up like he showed up to the prophet Elijah in a soft, still, small voice. Isn't it good to hear those soft, still, small voices? But we don't expect God to show up in our tragedies, in our calamities, in our chaos times of life. Job had all kinds of questions that he wanted to ask God about. it, But God had 77 questions to ask Job. Remember that? Here Job remembers that time of questioning when God showed up in his awesome goodness and glory and grandeur and when God showed up, guess what? Job shut up. Job couldn't even remember one question he wanted to ask God. Here Job responds to all that by basically saying, I've been a foolish man. I've talked like an expert about things I knew nothing about. Have you ever talked about things you knew nothing about? All the time, don't we? Absolutely. You know, Job did a, a lot of talking, didn't he? You see, you and I need to do more listening than talking when it comes to God. And here, Job uh, confesses the reality of his inadequacy and his insufficiency of understanding the mysteries in his life and the masteries of God over these mysteries and happenings. And he begins to realize that he didn't know as much as he thought he knew about his situation. You know, just because we're in a situation doesn't know, mean we know all about it. Just because we're experiencing it doesn't mean that we understand it. Amen? Well, here Job was trying to make heads or tails over the how comes, the what ifs, and the, and the whys of life. And, and now he realizes that he didn't understand anything about what was going on in his life, but God understood everything about what was going on in Job's when Job came to that realization, when he had that attitude of a heart, you know what happened? Job began to probe and go into a deeper, intimate relationship with God. Matter of fact, listen to what he says in Job chapter 42, verse 6. He said, I have heard of you by the hearing of my ears, but now my eyes have seen you. He says, I repent. I abhor my sin. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. So just keep those statements in mind. Here Job finally realizes his inadequacy, his insufficiency to understand the mysteries of what's going on. He knows he can't explain the happenings, and he begins to learn to trust in God. When are we going to start trusting in God around? You know, remember what the proverb writer says? It says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding and knowledge him in all thy ways and what? He'll direct thy path. Here you and I are going to have to choose a choice. And believing is a choice, amen? What are we going to choose between? Are we going to place our faith in ourselves or are we going to place our faith in God and God alone? My friends, you'll never understand the whys, the how comes, the what ifs of life. Don't try to reason them out. Don't let your situation and circumstance hold you captive. And we'll talk about that next week. Many of us are held captive by our lack of understanding, but also we're held captive by our situations and circumstances, and we get miserable inside. Well, here Job no longer would let his unanswered questions and his situations and circumstances hold him captive to depression and despair and disillusionment. In essence, Job was saying, I've struggled with discouragement, difficulties, disillusionment, disappointment, and depression long enough. I'm tired of it. I'm going to start believing in God. I'm going to believe in a God that knows all things. I'm going to believe in a God that, that no thought, no plan, no purpose, no mystery, no happening in life can be hid from him. I'm going to start believing in a God that can take all things, whether they're good or whether they're bad, and he can take all things and work them out for our good and for God's glory. Job says, I've been foolish, God. 
I spoke about things I knew nothing about. I uttered things like an expert over my situation. I knew nothing about my situation. I was presumptuous, and I am tired of trusting in myself, and I'm going to start trusting in God. You and I have to make a choice today. Are you going to continue to trust in yourself, or are you going to trust in God and God alone? Amen? You see, the choice is easy, but every, that one or the other choices always has an ultimate conclusion. Here we see Job's premise. He had finally come to the place that he was going to base his worldview, his philosophy of life, his religious beliefs on a God that he has faith in, that is, has infinite power and incredible sovereignty, and he's going to realize that he is inadequate and insufficient to try to figure out things, and he's going to leave it to God and God alone to make it right. That's where you and I must come to in our lives. Number two. Not only do I want you to see Job's premises, but also Job's dilemma. Job's dilemma. Remember at the very beginning of the book of Job, God highly esteemed Job. Remember that? He spoke honorably of Job. When all the angels, all the celestial beings came before the throne room of God, when Satan was there making false allegations and accusations against Job, saying Job served God for an ulterior motive. Remember what God said about Job in Job chapter 1 verse 8? It says, then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in all the earth? He's blameless, an upright man who fears God and shuns evil. In Job chapter 2, verse 3, uh, again, G God reiterates his, his respect toward his servant Job in front of Satan. And he says in verse 3, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in all the earth, a blameless, upright man who fears God and shuns evil? Do you see what's going on here? You see, Job had a general knowledge of God like all of us. Here today. We had a general knowledge of God, and that general knowledge of God caused Job to fear God. And that word fear doesn't mean that he trembled in the presence of God or that he was terrified by God, but that word fear depicts a reverential fear where he put God first and foremost. He lived a godly, righteous, up life life. Matter of fact, he stayed away from all people, all places, all things that would tempt him to stray or to drift away from God. He had that general knowledge that caused him to live that kind of life. Job knew about God. Now listen to me. Job knew about God. Job had heard about God. Job may have studied about God. But Job, in the early years of his life, had not reached a point of maturity of where he really knew God personally. Intimately. On an individual basis. He had not totally, thoroughly, completely trust God. And let me tell you something. If you can't totally, thoroughly trust God in every area of your life, you have not come to a full knowledge of who he is. I should have got an amen on that one. You know that I'm right if you follow the sequence of Job's revelation here. Job, uh, he had not come to a personal awareness of God until in Job chapter 42, and then he said, I've heard of you with my ears, but now with my eyes, I see you. Here Job makes a tremendous personal discovery in his life, and he acknowledges, I've always heard about you, but now I'm experiencing you for myself. Before this dramatic encounter with God, Job had always accepted the prevailing belief that when someone is right with God, that the suffering will cease. Have you ever heard preachers preach that way on television? They say, well, if you'll get right with God, you'll have wealth and health and prosperity and success. Well, Job bought into that prevailing belief at the very beginning of his life. He really believed that if you were right with God, that you would have prosperity, you'd have happiness, you'd have health, you'd have wealth and success. But guess what happened? In Job's very beginning, when he feared God, when he walked upright, when he stayed away from all appearances or temptations of evil, he was prosperous, but also something happened and he lost everything that was near and dear to him. 
what he had been taught about God now had been challenged. Have you ever been challenged about what you've been taught about God? Man's situation, circumstances will do it to you. Loss and tragedy will do it to you as well. Although Job's beliefs have conformed to what uh, was generally accepted to be right and true at, during his day and age, yet what he experienced was in contradiction of what he had been taught. When Job experienced that tragedy and loss, he saw a credibility gap between what he had been taught and what he had experienced. Friends, when you face tragedy and loss, you're going to face some credibility gaps in your life. Tragedy and loss will do one or two things. Are you, are you listening to me? It'll either drive you away from God or it'll drive you to God. And in Job's case, it drove him to God. Job began to realize some things that he had not realized before. He realized that everything that he had been taught, everything he had been told, everything that he thought was right was not necessarily right. That he had to experience the truth from God and God alone. And he realized his inadequacy, inadequacies to understand the happenings and the mysteries of life. And then he started not trusting in himself, but trusting in his God. And the Bible says he repented. You know what the word repent means? There was a turning point in his life. And that turning point brought about a dynamic encounter with God that transformed his life forever. That's what we see in Job chapter 46. It's very clear. What are the options? Here, here's this dilemma. I want you to get it. I don't want you to, to not understand what I'm saying. Job either had to have a secondhand faith or a firsthand faith. Let me, everybody wake up and listen to me. Look at me. I'm going to ask you, do you have a secondhand faith or a firsthand faith? Don't answer too quickly. Because you might find out that you don't have the first-hand faith you thought you did. What is a first-hand or a second-hand faith? Let's go to the second-hand faith. That's what we want to look at first. The second-hand faith. That, that is a faith that you've heard about, that you know about, that you've studied about, that was in your father or mother, or that was in your grandmother or grandfather, or that was come from a family member or a friend, but yet it has not become your personal faith. Understand what I said? Let me say it like this. There are so many people that come to church, they sing spiritual songs, they're involved in religious activities, but they do it because that's how they were raised up, not because of a personal, intimate relationship with God. A second-hand faith is when you know about God and you've heard about God, but you don't know God. You know about him, but you don't know him. There's a big difference. How many of you know about Washington, George Washington? How many of you know about Abraham Lincoln? How many of you read about him? Okay, how many of you know them? Big difference. We all have second-hand knowledge here of George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. Let me tell you something. Here is the grave danger. Hear me very closely. This happens with our relationship with God. You may hear me preach about God. You may hear me tell you about God. You may be involved in studies about God. You may even talk about God because of what you heard about God in the past and still not know God. Are you getting it? Say amen. Why is secondhand faith so popular? Well, first of all, write this down. It never goes against traditions. It always maintains the status flow. It doesn't get any kind of outburst of enthusiasm or passion or excitement or thrill about God. It just wants to be proper, prim and proper. You don't want to offend anybody. You play it safe. And you don't have to change when you have a second-hand faith. All you have to do is conform to the norm that's around you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Why is second-hand faith so popular? Because it doesn't make any demands on our lives. You know, we, we, we don't have to serve God. All we have to do is just sit there and just be a spectator and watch somebody else serve God. 
It doesn't bring any motivation to, to risk rejection. We don't want to go out and witness to anybody or tell people about Jesus. We may invade their privacy or, or we might end up offending them. But you know what the Bible says about the gospel? The Bible says the gospel is an offense to some, but is the power of God to salvation to those who believe. Secondhand faith will just cause you to worship in the outward formalities of religiosity. Never experiencing that inward reality of a sincere heart that hungers and thirsts for more of God. Are you getting this? Man, I hope you understand. Let me tell you something. I am so afraid that most of us have a secondhand faith. Secondhand faith will cause you to talk about what the church ought to be, what the church ought to do, and many of you have said that. But it will never get you involved in things where you can help the church become and be what it should be. Secondhand faith will say all that soul winning, all that reaching of souls, that's what the pastor does. That's what the, uh, what the chosen leadership does. But it never takes responsibility personally for that ministry, that outreach activity, because it doesn't want to give up its priorities in their personal lives. You know what secondhand faith does? It serves God by proxy, not personal. Not only will secondhand faith make no demands on you, but a secondhand faith won't give you any satisfaction or fulfillment. The quickest recipe to misery is to have no depth in your spirituality. You know what a secondhand faith person will do? They will try to solve things in their own intellect. They'll try to handle things in their own strength. But when they come to their end of their strength, guess what? They can't handle it because they don't have the supernatural power of God because they don't have that first-hand faith. Remember Jesus talked about it. Remember that parable that Jesus told about the sower that went out to sow seed and some of the seed fell on what? Shallow ground. Remember that? And that seed germinated and sprouted and all of a sudden it began to grow and as the sun came up, it did what? It withered away. Why? It had shallow faith. You know why many of us wither away in the heat of life? You know why so many people can't take the stress and strain and pressure and pains of life? How you see them withering in their spirituality, withering in their potentials, withering in their ministries, withering away from the church. You know why? Because they have a secondhand faith. They have no depth in their faith. They have no deep rootage in their relationship with God. They are shallow. Do you understand what I mean by second-hand faith? Let me ask you a question. If we can only repeat what someone else has heard, we'll be at the mercy of our doubts and be insecure about our faith. If we always rely on someone else's spiritual experience, how will we ever experience the presence of God? If we rely heavy on somebody else telling us how to go through a crisis, when will we learn how to walk by faith and not by sight? Let me ask you this serious question. And you'll see the difference between a second-hand faith and a first-hand faith. These songs we sang here today with the praise band, how many of those words reflect a personal experience you've had with God? Or how much of those words you sang were just about somebody else's experience with God? You know, you can come to church and know what to say and, and know when to stand and know when to sit and your prayers can be full of religious themes about it. But listen to me. Are you listening? Does your singing, does your serving, does your actions, does your workings in your life reflect a personal experience with God or are you merely copycatting somebody else's experience? There is a difference between first-hand faith and second-hand faith. And I believe that most Baptists don't see it. I can only speak about Baptists because I are one. Amen? <laughs> now watch this first-hand faith. Here we go. Get this down. This first-hand faith comes from a 
personal encounter with God. Here we see Job journeying through this tragic situation, through these tragic experiences, and he's making that journey and it's taking him right into a dynamic relationship with God. Job says, I have heard of you with the hearing of my ears. I've had that secondhand faith, but now with my eyes I see you. I have that firsthand faith. That's where you and I need to get. Amen? Where we're no longer having a hearsay religion. What a hearsay religion is? It's what you hear, you say. <laughs> a lot of us have a hearsay religion. What we've heard, we say. We need to have a no-so religion. A no-so relationship with Jesus Christ. We're not just repeating what Pastor Moore says. We're not repeating what somebody else has sung about their spiritual experience. We are retelling you or remembering our personal encounters with God. That's where Job is at. I hope you're getting this. So crucial you understand what I'm saying. Have you ever noticed that Job didn't encounter God until he lost all of his possessions? All of his children were taken away from him. He had boils and sores all over him. His wife turned against him. And his so-called friends falsely accused him of being dishonest, lacking integrity and honesty, sincerity and real spirituality. It wasn't until Job lost everything that was near and dear to him that he had an encounter with the God God. Remember that old hymn, The things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory wonder and grace. Here's the third thing I want you to see real quickly. I want you to see Job's choice. I got to hurry. Time is, is my enemy today. I hate time. But here's Job's choice. Job had chosen to not have a secondhand faith anymore. He was tired of hearing about God. He wanted to know God. You and I have to come to that choice. And when he made that choice of going to first-hand faith, that's when things begin to change. Notice the Bible, what the Bible says in, in Job chapter 42, verse 6. It says, therefore I abhor myself and I repent in dust and ashes. What does the word repentance mean? Does anybody know? It's a change, a turning point. That's what happens in true faith. There's a turning point that happens. It's a change in one's heart that brings a change in one's mind that brings a change in one's direction and one's standards of living. And it's interesting because remember the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and Aramaic. The Hebrew word for repentance here is N-I-C-H-A-M, Nikam. It's translated repentance here in Job chapter 42 verse 6. But in most cases when that same Hebrew word is used in the Old Testament, it's translated comfort. You see, when you really repent, it's going to bring a comfort to your life. When you make that change, when you have that turning point, that comfort, that peace, that serenity, that security... That victory that you have longed to experience becomes reality. When you and I repent like God tells us to, God opens up the doors of blessing upon our life. Remember Acts 3.19, it says, Repent and turn to God that your sins might be blotted out. Then shall you experience the refreshing from above. Here we see Job experiencing it. And what a beautiful picture the choice Job made. We're going to talk about two things real quickly. Write them down. First of all, Job's choice involved a new direction. A new direction. When Job repented, he turned around in his direction and purpose. He said, notice, in verse 6, what does he say there? Everybody look at it in verse 6. I am disappointed with myself. Is that what he says? I'm really saddened by how I am. No, what, what is the word he uses? I adhor myself. In other words, I've hated what I've become through all this loss and tragedy. I've hated what I've become be without God as the center of my life as I went through all of this. I hated what I've said, what I've done, what I've thought. 
You say, Pastor, I thought you told me that, that Job was a righteous man, that he was a godly man, that he stayed away from all temptations of evil. They put God first and foremost. He did at the very beginning. But I want you to know, in the middle of his loss and his tragedies, Job did some things and said some things and thought some things he should never have done and said and thought. And haven't we all? Job had to repent because he cursed the very day he was born. When God says, I have a plan for you, declares the Lord. Not a plan of calamity, but for welfare to give you hope and a future. You know what else he had to repent of? Because he wanted to die. Have you ever wanted to die before? You don't have to answer that. That's a rhetorical question. Job wanted to die, but Job realized he would have short-circuited everything that God had for him in the present and the future. Job made some harsh statements when he was depressed and discouraged and disappointed and disillusioned. Have you ever made harsh statements? Have you ever harshly charged God of something that was not his fault? Have you ever blamed God for a situation and circumstance that you've been in? God, why would you allow this to happen to me? God, why didn't you stop it? God, if you're so powerful, why didn't you do a miracle at that point? We've all asked those questions. And Job says, I repent of questioning your purpose because I realize that in the end, you work all things out for your good to those that love the Lord. Job had to repent because he talked too much about his situation and said some things that he said because he had a limited perspective of who God really was. It's repentance. That's humbling ourselves. That's emptying ourselves. That's letting go all that pus, that poison, that venom that's destroying us because we don't have enough faith in God. Amen or oh me. Here's a second point. Job's choice brought about a new standard. Job's choice brought about a new standard. Of measurement, I should say. Before Job repented, guess who he measured his life by? His friends. Have you ever compared yourself with somebody else? I'm just as good as they are. Maybe a little bit better. Oh, we wouldn't dare say that, would we? Let me tell you something. It's foolish for you to compare yourself with another human being. It's like comparing a crooked stick with a crooked stick. Amen? For all have sinned come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned each one to his own way. Our righteousness are filthy rags. Should I go on? <laughs> All have sinned, come short of the glory of God. And what is the glory of God? It's Jesus. Before Job repented, he compared himself with other situations and circumstances and people and places and things. But after he repented, guess what happened? God became his standard of comparison. Remember when God showed up in Job chapter 38 and 39 and 40? He was saying, look at me, Job, and look at you. He's wanting Job to compare himself with God. And when you and I come to that point, when we compare ourselves with God, we're going to find out we drastically fall short, don't we? God says, be ye holy as I am holy. Remember what Paul said about Jesus, that God has given him a name above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. We have a high standard. And guess what? On our own strength and ability, we cannot measure up to God. Job thought he knew more than God did about his situation. Do you understand that at the end? At the beginning, he did real well. The Bible says he did not sin against God with his lips. Did you catch that? With his lips. But later on, in the middle of his loss, his tragedy, just like us, we lose sight of who God is. Now Job has come to his senses, his real spiritual senses. He cannot compare himself with God anymore. He is inadequate, and God is all sufficient to meet his needs. 
And all of God's people said, Amen, Amen to that. But aren't you glad that God's made a provision for our inadequacies and insufficiencies and flawed abilities? Remember what he said in Philippians 2.13? It is God at work in you to do his will and his good pleasure. God's going to do something through us we cannot do in and of ourselves. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ Jesus which strengtheneth me. Through the abiding and dwelling Holy Spirit, and the strength of Christ's energizing power in us, you and I can live the Christian life like we ought to live it. Every once in a while, I'll witness to someone, and they'll tell me, Pastor, I would really love to become a Christian, but I don't have what it takes to become a Christian. You know what I do when they say those things? I put out my hand and say, put her there. Neither do I. I cannot be a Christian in and of myself. I don't have the strength to do that, and neither do you. I don't have the ability to do that. But guess what? That's why I need Jesus to come inside of me because Jesus does through me what I can't do in and of myself. Amen for that. Job has come to that realization. Let me ask you, have you come to a point through your loss and your tragedy that you realize your inadequacy and God's supernatural ability? In your dilemma, in the midst of your loss and tragedy, are you still trying to trust in your own self, your own strength, your own intelligence to get you through? Or are you trusting in God and God alone? Do you have a secondhand faith? All of us here, I believe, have a secondhand faith. Now, you may have a firsthand faith, but I believe all of us do have a secondhand faith. You've heard about God today, amen? You studied about God today. You know about God today, but do you know him? Not just know about him, but do you know him? Have you went from believing about him to placing your faith in him? How does that happen? Through a personal relationship with Jesus. You've got to realize you're a sinner in desperate need of a Savior. Amen? You've got to respond to God's love for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And how do you respond? You, you need to repent. And repentance is more than just turning from your sins to the Savior. Repentance is turning from yourself to Jesus. Guess who your main enemy is? Not Satan and sin. They're close second. You're your main enemy. Listen to me. I have watched you and I've watched me. And guess what? I can tell you by how I've watched you for many years. You are your main enemy. I've watched you ruin things. And you've watched me ruin things. You are your main enemies. Did I look at everybody? Including myself. You've got to learn not only to turn from your sins, but to turn from yourself to God alone. And then you've got to receive him by faith. And that's more than believing about him. It's placing your faith in him alone. And then you've got to surrender your situation. I mean really surrender it over to him. And let him become your Lord and Master and Savior. And if you'll do that, you'll have a personal encounter with God in which you will go from secondhand faith to firsthand faith. And that firsthand faith will bring about the transformation and changes and turning points in your life. And all of God's people said, Amen.